This is the, uh, the panel for helping the writers find the right narrator. Um, they have not closed the door yet, so you still have a chance to get out if you want to <laughs> real quickly. Um, no, I'm glad you're here, and I hope that uh, when you leave, you will be glad that, uh, that you came. We have a great panel for you here that I'm really happy with. Uh, we have one of the most influential voices in the audiobook publishing world from a publisher perspective who is deeply involved in many projects that get recognized at the very highest level for their quality, innovation, and sales results. Does anybody care about that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also have a couple of independent narrators who uh, also produce work that is getting recognized for those same reasons, who are on the front lines doing the narration and the production uh, directly. Uh, we even have at least one narrator out here in the audience. Chris, there is... Uh, is uh, great, and he's been on the panel with me here before doing this, so um, he's another one that you can talk to after if you have any questions. Um, I'm Chris Abernathy. I've narrated about uh, 250 titles, working with the biggest publishers and authors who are sticking their toes into the audiobook water for the first time, um, such as a couple of guys that started publishing at the same time I started narrating, uh, Craig Martell and Michael Anderley. Uh, I claim 100% responsibility for their successes. <laughs> Um, which are much larger than mine, but uh, no, I'm very happy for them, and I was very, very fortunate to get connected with, uh, with good people, and that's why I'm here today. So now I'd like to uh, let each of the panelists, we'll start with Victoria over here, um, please introduce yourselves, tell everybody a little bit about you, uh, and make sure you use oh. my stuff. Is it on? Yes. Yeah, I'm, see, I'm not a professional narrator, so I don't know how to use a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Victoria Guck, and I'm the publisher at Podium, and although not strictly responsible for casting, um, I have conversations with authors and our production team on a daily basis about um, who is going to be uh, the voice behind the titles that we publish, uh, and thanks, Chris, for your, your generous introduction. Um, we publish about 1,800 audiobooks this, this year, and we'll do about 2,500 next year, so uh, we're one of the... Uh, one of the biggest independent audiobook publishers, and certainly the the number one in sci-fi and fantasy. Hi, I'm Chris Mayer. Um, I've been narrating for a little over 10 years, uh, and kind of fell into like an advisory role right away, because um, when I first started, all of my authors were brand new as well. So I just immediately fell into that uh, guide to help them navigate everything, and that sort of the, the role that I really enjoy playing. So my thing is I love working with independent uh, authors and especially new authors, helping them navigate the landscape, find exactly who they need if it's not me, um, and just help their audio be successful. I'm Veronica Jaguer, uh, like Chris. I'm an independent audiobook narrator. I started, I think the first piece I did got out in about 2011. I've been narrating full time since 2017. And I've mostly worked with uh, indie authors because I love bringing their work to life in audio. And it's, it's just a joy to, to watch something go from the adventure on the page to a full bodied experience that so many people get to enjoy. And, um, if you don't know Veronica, I also narrate as Vivian Ferrari, and so it's it's fun to have that that dual ness of I can do the adventury stuff and I can do the spicy stuff, um, and help authors figure out which route to go. Cool. So we are here to talk about audiobooks and finding the right narrator. You sure you want to get into this? I mean. Do you really have time to hit refresh on that ACX dashboard as much as you do the KDP dashboard? <laughs> no, constantly hitting refresh is not gonna help your business, sadly. I'd be a millionaire. Um, but adding a new revenue stream can make a big difference in your bottom line. So we're gonna spend the next 45 minutes helping you get there. I suspect that everyone here realizes that all of us up here are in the business of producing audiobooks with professional human narration. There are people at this conference who can tell you everything you want to know about AI-generated voices. We're going to keep our discussion focused on finding the right narrator and how you can get the best product possible to increase your reach and your reputation. 
Um, one thing I had planned to mention anyway is now more than ever, show of hands, how many of you have claimed ownership of your books on ACX? All right, so we've got plenty that in here that haven't. Uh, do it before somebody else does. There are people that will do that, okay? And it's easier than ever to throw up something uh, quickly and it can affect your um, reputation and take money that, uh, that should be yours. Um, I'm not giving away any secrets by saying that producing audiobooks is expensive. Some authors come in thinking that uh, narrating their own books might be the way to go, save them some money and for other reasons. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists to start off, uh, why should they think very long and hard before going that route? Victoria, will you start? Yeah, definitely. And just to, uh, just to back up for a minute on that PSA you just mentioned about claiming your books on ACX, um, this is so important. And even if you don't plan to use ACX itself, if you do plan to partner with a publisher like us, that it doesn't matter. You should still claim your book on ACX. And I think that's something that you know, you tell your fellow authors who are not at this particular session. You know, we've had a couple of recent instances where, you know, um, author where we have rights to, you know, book two in a series. You know, the author has published it, and like a day later, there's a pirated audiobook up on Amazon. Um, meanwhile, we're you know working through the production of the professional audiobook, and and those pirated titles sell, and it's it's a nightmare. So uh, th that can be avoided by just you know, you, you publish your ebook and then you claim it on ACX and then and then you can decide what to do with it. Um, sorry, so about um, <laughs> author narration. You know, there are some authors that should narrate their own books and those are authors who have a platform, potentially. Um, they make, they're non-fiction authors, they're business authors, um, they have a podcast, they've got a vibrant Instagram and social media presence and the audiobook is an extension of their brand. And, you know, having, being, uh, you know, a personality, it becomes very important that they do that. However, I would say Tony Robbins, you know, who is like one of the most famous <laughs> self-help and uh, speaker type of people in the world, um, he has somebody else narrate his own audiobooks. So that is also, so having just said that, it's not also 100% the case. Um, as far as fiction is concerned, I would never suggest an author narrates their own their own fiction audiobook unless they are a trained actor um, and knows how to you know bring those performance skills to all the characters in in the book that they've imagined there are definitely some fiction authors out there who do it Jim Butcher we actually produced um, a novella of his that he he wanted to narrate he he wrote it with the idea that he was going to narrate it and he, but he's like a radio guy and he's had experience. It was still a tough sledding for him, um, but he really enjoyed doing it. So again, there's exceptions to, to every rule and I'm not saying there are any rules, um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of work and I'll, I'll leave it to the, the professionals to explain why. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna speak assuming that you have no acting background. Um, I'm gonna make a joke here. Narrating audiobooks is hard. I mean, it's, it's doing a complete play, all the roles, stage direction, and if you don't have any acting background, you're not really going to be able to put the type of uh, nuance, get the characters, get everything, and make the best performance that a trained uh, audiobook narrator can, because this is an acting job. Um, you might be able to read your book really well, you know, have to go to events, and, but it's, it's different than being behind the mic and acting it. Uh, plus, physically, uh, Bruce Springsteen said, yeah, he narrated his own thing, and he said after doing it, this was harder than doing a four-hour show, seven days a week. Um, it takes a l big toll on you, uh, mentally, physically, and, and if you're not ready for that, Honestly, you're better off spending your time writing and let someone who is experienced in this give you the best possible product while you give them the best possible product to make even better. All right, I want to try to actually get to as many questions as we can. So, sorry, Veronica. That's okay. I want to 
if we can do one or two answers to each, unless somebody's got something that they really want, do you want to throw the, anything in on that? The one thing I will throw in is um, we have the equipment. Mm -hmm. So why are you going to invest in even more time and energy to get the right equipment, to get the right recording space, when, quite frankly, you yeah. should be writing? And, and the technical skills. And the yeah. technical skills. All right, so before approaching a narrator, We'll start with you on this one, Veronica. What information should you have ready to share with them to make sure you are ready for the next steps, that everybody's on the same page, and they have the best opportunity to help you? All right, so I'm going to assume fiction on this. Have your manuscript ready. I mean, if you've published the book, perfect. But have the manuscript ready and edited. Um, it should be exactly what you're going to put out in ebook and print. Have character notes. This is your opportunity to geek out about how much you love your work and the worlds that you have built. If you have setting notes, if you have language and dialect notes, this is an auditory medium. We got to make it sound good. If you have anything else that inspires you, Pinterest boards, playlists. If you have, you know, your your board with who you would cast in your perfect series, we want that. We want to get as excited as you are about this new world and these new characters. So this isn't the rando in the bar who's going to roll their eyes and go, oh, please stop talking about your book. We will sit down for three hours. Tell me everything. Really, tell us everything. Anything big to add on that? I, I mean, I really don't have too much more. I mean, I, <laughs> more is more. I mean, it, you, like Veronica said, tell us everything you possibly can especially if it's a series. Yeah. We are not going to give away secrets. I, I was actually about to anecdote on yeah. that. Um, I, I narrated for Jen Rose, who's here, um, her first book in the Twins of Orion series. I sat down with her. I'm like, all right, so tell me about these characters. Tell me about... She went and told me the entire five-book series, all of the characters, all the secrets. I know everything. <laughs> um, but doing that, I knew connections between characters that weren't going to be revealed until books three, four, five. So I was able to bring a nuance to the performance that I wouldn't have done otherwise. I, I might have read it a completely different way, which would have fallen flat or didn't work. Or mm -hmm. I was able to make the right choices for that book because I knew mm -hmm. what she wanted me to do. Yeah, and I think just from a process standpoint, this is something you can be thinking of while you're writing. So instead of you know, getting putting the notes document together maybe at the end when you're finished, if you're just sort of, as you're working through writing the book, making the odd note here and there that you think is gonna come in handy for a narrator. And I, I totally agree, no detail is too small. Even the obvious things, like super obvious things, like how a main character's name is pronounced, you know, it's very su subjective. And we, <laughs> we had one the other day, yeah, it was, the character's called Bo, but this author is from South Carolina and they say it, Bew. We would never have known that. And then we would have had it uh, 300 times throughout the book and it would have been impossible to, to uh, correct. So all of those times, and your own name, like getting, if you have a, you know, even John Smith can be Smythe. So yeah, it's, it's obvious time. <laughs> all right, so Chris, if somebody's going to be asking for auditions from narrators, mm -hmm. How do they choose a really good slice of their work to be auditioned? Um, first of all, don't get caught up in having to do a full scene. Figure out what's important to you, what you want to hear, like the main character, any, any major supporting characters. Um, if there's an accent you want to hear, uh, you want to hear me do action. Uh, or, or if there's romance, you want to hear how I handle a romantic scene, you can do little snippets of scenes. Um, but keep it to about two pages or so, because you don't need more than two minutes, because you'll know. But make sure those two minutes have everything that you need to hear to choose your narrator. And that's about 500 words. Yeah. All right, Victoria. You've got a choice, you've narrowed things down to two narrators. One is the big name that has done 200 books in this genre, 
including the three top bestsellers. The other, hardly anybody knows who they are, but they're the perfect fit for this story. Who are you casting? I mean, the perfect fit, always. I mean, it's, there is a temptation to look for the shiny names and the Instagram followings, potentially. Um, but I think the audio product has to sing, and if you don't have the perfect voice, then you won't get those ratings, you won't get those reviews, and you've potentially then wasted you know, a premium amount of money on just somebody who, who brings a name. And, and we've seen this with celebrities, like, you know, real, genuinely, like, peop pe names people know, and it does not, it doesn't really move the needle. A, a good performance moves the needle. You guys, anything else on that? All right. He's the expert. Yeah. Yep. The whole point of doing an audio book for, uh, for most of us is to have that additional revenue stream, right? I mean... We like having an audio book. It's nice, but we're not spending the money just because it's nice. We're, we're doing it because we want to make more money. And marketing is important in making money. So if you as an author hire a narrator or contract with a narrator and, and you want them to help market your audio book that you own, I'm assuming this isn't a royalty share, but you, you now own that audio book. Is, is that something that they should be setting aside a little budget to try to get you to help them with the marketing? What are some things that they need to consider on that? Well, budget is certainly nice. I mean, time is time, and just like writers write, narrators narrate. Um, but be a good human, you know? If you want that conversation, I've been asked to join author Facebook groups and chime in on conversations. That takes next to none of my time, and I like interacting with people. Um, to go on TikTok or Facebook Live, it's a little thing. But if you're going to ask for more, if you're going to ask for newsletter swaps, if you're going to ask for you know longer interviews, maybe you've got a podcast and you're going to bring your narrator in on that, a little bit of marketing budget is nice. Um, I've personally not had that, so I, c I can't speak to it, but I, I like to promote fun stuff. So, but just ask, bring it up, ask for ideas. Um, I like to think of it as a partnership. I, I want to see the product succeed. Yeah, and I mean, generally, we're happy to work with you to you know, put out a little blurb on TikTok or Facebook, do some Q&A, whatever, because selfishly, we're also marketing ourselves by doing that. Um, so we're happy to, to deal. Marketing budget is nice, uh, but just, you know, be nice, ask, be friendly. If we if we establish a good rapport, sure, you know, I'll go mm -hmm. on and ask me anything for about an hour. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not really a big deal. Um, and there's a lot you can do with a, with a little budget mm -hmm. just by doing some, you know, viral marketing or word of mouth or, again, the QAs or just fun little 30-second blasts. You can do that. Yeah, one of the things that we've done, obviously, we, we partner with hundreds and hundreds of narrators. Um, but and, and obviously, not every project has opportunities for this, but certainly in the a lot of the romance we've been doing, you know, it's very, uh, it's spicy on TikTok. Um, so one idea, uh, you know, is just to, if, if when you start working with a narrator, if you're like, okay, this particular sentence or this particular bit of dialogue is, is what I want to then put out there to, you know, promote the book on socials, on reels or whatever, highlighting that to the narrator ahead of time so that they can clip that and make sure that it's, you know, it's just in a separate file for, to help you. Um, is, is definitely um, one thing that you guys can partner on and, and it takes no time at all. But yeah, I'd echo on the, the thoughtfulness of like how much you're, how much you're asking for. Um, but again, we're all partners in this and you know, what, what works for the author also helps the narrator um, within reason. 
one of my biggest clients that I've had um, just absolutely loved that I went on his social media and interacted with his readers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that made a, a big difference. He certainly thought it made a big difference. Um, and I did that a little bit just because I want to do it, you know. We, we want to we want to do that, but if you want to say, if you think, you know, that's really going to be helpful, I'd like you to do that a significant amount of time. That might be something to think about. You know, I'm willing to give you something for you to do that um, beyond just the, the, a couple of things that you happen to notice. Um, Long-term relationship between author and narrator. How, how important, it, it's hugely important. That's the answer. It's hugely important to think about that. What are some things specifically that we should be thinking about that long-term relationship as we're getting started? Um, well, one of the biggest things, if you've got a big series, and that could be five, seven, ten, fifteen books, or you don't know how long it's going to be, um, again, like we said before, don't hide the secrets. If you're a pantser, I get it. Um, you may not know what the secret is. But share as much as you can and keep us informed. If you know, well, I'm not going to get back to that series for another six months or another year, let us know. And at the same time, well, I'm going to plan on releasing this book in 2024 Q2. Great. I would love to be able to put that on my calendar because as far as, far as I do, my my long-standing relationships, that gets first dibs on my calendar. If we have worked together before, you go on there first in permanent ink, and people get scheduled around you. So just have that dialogue. And the other thing is we refer each other. I will talk about my authors all the time because they're awesome. But I know that, do. yeah, but, and, and the same thing is, you know, refer your narrators to others you know don't don't keep us in the dark you know we're not just for you we can work with everybody but you know share the love I mean the only thing to add that it's just it's just communication just like any other relationship just communication um, I'm big on communication I will communicate with you where I am in the process if you have questions I'll, I will tell you sometimes I even you know with the, narrative, with the authors I had the close relationship with, I have air tables. You know, let nice, them in on yeah. the air table so they can check in and, and, and make and add their notes to it. So I don't, they don't have to, you know, if we can't have that conversation. Um, and it's a two way street. Communicate to us, like Veronica was saying, about what you're doing. Um, and in that communication, you're going to build a great relationship. And I've made some great friends through doing this and they don't have anything for me you know yet but we still keep in contact hey, I'm writing a new series I'm doing this I'm doing that um, and I will absolutely put time aside and do that book as as soon as they tell me it's coming because I love I love that author yeah. you know and I will bend over backwards to help them because we have that relationship and so that's what's really important mm -hmm. is building that relationship through communication Tori, I know that uh, when somebody comes to you and before you ever tell them that you've got some narrators for them to consider or that you're, you're considering what you, you've already done that. Yeah, I mean, we have a, a bit of a mediated relationship um, with between the author and the narrator. You know, as a publisher, you know, we fun work fundamentally differently from that direct relationship, but, and, and we need to stay in the middle because we have a team of um, proofers and editors and production people who need to know what's going on. So you know, there that things can get things can fall through the cracks if there's communication directly with the narrator about logistical things. They may you know they're like, oh, I've got a new script. I, I you know updated a few things. And I've just dropped it here. Like if we don't get that script. Then, then we have a problem. So we we don't, you know, it's not like we're walling off narrators from communicating with authors. We're not doing that, and they communicate all the time on socials. But as far as like the process of producing the audiobook, you know, we stay very much in the middle um, and handle, you know, all those details. But just in terms of like the relationship factor, I mean, we 
also pride ourselves on, on having fantastic relationships with narrators because we're, you know, that you are our primary um, source for, for work. <laughs> well, not just, you know, you got direct, direct relationships, but we know that you count on us to know the schedule, you know, be accountable, send the work when we promise, try not to change the schedule too much, while also working with authors who, you know, who also have some changes in their lives. So we, we again, we communicate a lot clearly, you know, so we know, you know, what we're gonna be able to put in front of you and when. I just, I wanna add one little tiny thing to that. A little secret, if we have a good relationship, our performance will be better. Unconsciously. I'm not going to say if you're a jerk, we're going to do a bad job because we're professionals. We're not going to do that. I mean, we're, we're actors. We love everything that's put in front of us. That's our job. But if we have a great relationship and I love you, that love is going to come across into, into the material. Um, One thing you definitely don't want is to have to change narrators halfway through a series or after the first or second book. Uh, well, there may be some cases where you do want that, but um, generally speaking, you don't want that. And on top of that, your narrator does not want to come in behind somebody else. I've done it a couple of times because I was begged to. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to do that. We don't want to fall. If they're reading, if they're listening to book three in the series, they, they liked the narrator for one and two. It doesn't matter how good you are. Somebody's not going to like your performance. We don't want to do that. It's harder for us. The reception's going to be different. Think these things through ahead of time. Talk to your narrator. Deliver your scripts on time so that everything flows and everybody will be happier. Budget, of course, is a big issue. Um, it can be daunting to really get a grasp of how much I need to, mm -hmm. to have budgeted. Victoria, you kind of take that out of the equation for yep. most of the, uh, the authors, but uh, for you guys, what do they need to be thinking about budget-wise? How, how can they get a grasp of what it's really going to cost? I'm always very upfront. You know, I lay out all of the, all the various options, you know, for a finished hour, royalty share, royalty share hybrid, whatever, all the options. Um, and then I give my rate. And if they're sticker shock, I will go into what goes into that rate, how many hours it really takes, how much work does it really gets done so that they understand that I'm not asking for, you know, like $4,000, $5,000 just because I'm going to quote that. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, but by the same token, I am flexible. I, I think a lot of us are very flexible. We'll work with you on your budget. So you need to think about how much money you're willing to put into this product um, because it is, at the end of the day, it is a product that's going to earn you money, and you want the best product you can get. So figure out what your budget is um, and how flexible you can be. Um, if, if you want to go royalty share hybrid, if you want to do this, if you want to maybe chip in for, for post-production a little bit more, um, and have that discussion. Don't be afraid to have that discussion. We're not going to get offended if you go, well, I can't really afford this. Can we do this? That's why we're telling you what we cost and what we, so that we can work out it, something that works for both of us and get you the audio you, you deserve. And when I have this discussion, you're investing in your audio book. You are creating a second product that you are going to be able to sell and get a whole new audience. Your reading audience is not necessarily your listening audience. So by investing in audio, you're going to get a whole new audience who is going to love your work. And you know, like Chris said, we're flexible. If you're like, well, I don't know if I can afford that, have you thought about you know, crowdfunding? Have you thought about Kickstarter? If that's on the plate, communicate that to your potential narrator because we love that stuff. We can help you, you know, drum up interest. Mm -hmm. we're, we're more than happy to do that. We attended the sessions here about that because we have that information so we can help you. All right. We're down to the last 15 minutes. You guys came here because you have questions about audiobooks. Let's hear those questions. Please come to the microphone. Hi. Um, one of my
my questions is I write romance, so it's dual point of view. Um, I want to know when I'm hiring them, like, do I do two separate auditions and then try to, like, how do you make sure that the guy and the girl sound good together, that they play off each other and they're going to be good? A lot of us actually, a lot of us have partners that we'll work with. Um, like, you, you, if you, you come to, for instance, you come to me and say, I want to do this, you'll need a, you know, I'll need a, a female partner to work with. I'll have ideas already of who works with my voice. So we okay. can help you with that. Um, okay. Or you can look for both independently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I've had both. I've had people come and say, I, I want you to narrate this. Do you know someone who you can work with? And you know, I've found other people. I've been on the other side of that with male narrators saying, hey, I landed this project. Want to come play? Got and it. I'll send the audition. Do you have someone to add or? Yeah, I mean, uh, then in our yeah. casting process, that's what we'll figure out. And oftentimes we are using kind of known narrator pairs, mm -hmm. um, but we, we'll put different voices together. But the key thing that, that we, can, we offer to the process, which I'm sure you deal with as well, is making sure both narrators are on the same page with pronunciations mm -hmm. and how characters are gonna be, um, well, characterized so that when the guy is doing the female dialogue in the guy chapters, the female sounds close-ish to oh, the female point. narrator. And that, that, that is, because you know, to your point about um, consistency and not, not changing narrators mm -hmm. mid-course, like consistency is key with audiobook listeners. They'll mm -hmm. pick up things like in a nanosecond, and that will throw them out of the audiobook and That's a it's good reflected point. in the reviews. And then my last one, just in general, is I don't even know the, lo the lead time on this, like from reaching out to actually get on the calendar and recording and then when it's gonna be ready. Like what kind of, I'm sure Podium's different than individuals, but like what is that process on a book that's already out? Just a, a, a conversation. I mean, everybody's yeah. gonna be different. We all have different calendars. We all have different. Yeah. Is there an average time of like it takes six months to do a book, it takes six weeks to do a book? Like from beginning, from, from com getting it, on your calendar to being ready? It depends, it's gonna depend on word count. If you, if for me, if you're talking about a single voice narration from the initial conversation, if we, if emails yeah. are answered on time and all that good stuff, for me, it's about six to eight weeks. Okay. And that's, that's just how my workflow happens. Other people can do it far more quickly. Some people take more time. And that's post-production and everything, like it's ready to... For me, yes, it okay. is. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You mentioned not liking to pick up a series after another narrator has started. However, <laughs> sometimes narrators ghost. Yes. And I'm sure you guys get authors who ghost you. Yep. So how do you deal with, how can an author approach a new narrator to continue a series where a narrator has ghosted them? I mean, sorry, do you want? Go ahead. I mean, one idea, depending on your budget, is just to re-record, depending on how many books are out there, if it's only one, then it might be worth starting again, assuming that the sales are still gonna be there. I mean, obviously that's the calculus you have to make. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, narrators pass away and narrate that, you know, stuff happens that is unavoidable and, and we've definitely done it. Um, and the key again is consistency and trying to find the right narrator and then communicating to your fans and saying, hey, You've all been asking me where this audiobook is for all this time. Well, I'm giving it to you. And by the way, I've got this fantastic new narrator, and they are just um, going to be even better than Joe Schmo on book one. And uh, I invite you to leave great ratings and reviews on Audible, and um, and then hope that the lovers get there before the haters. Mm. Set setting expectations with your readers and listeners helps. As someone, uh, you know, looking to invest a large amount of money in a narrator, what are red flags when you're trying to find someone, and what are like best practices for you know, like searching people on the different exchanges and stuff? I would say be wary of anyone who considers it a hobby or a side gig. Um, it's a job. It is a career. And it, it's, it's not a get rich quick thing. So when you're looking for someone, even if they haven't done that many books, if they've done books 
and they sound great and their samples are great and they are dedicated, that's fine. But if it, if it feels off, it probably is. Yeah, if, if they will not, all those conversations we've been talking about today, if they will not have those conversations with you, they're probably not the narrator for you. If you go looking for a bargain, you might get one, or you might get like the author that came to me after spending $50 per finished hour on a narrator who did three short books and took a year or more to get those three short books done and then wasn't available or wasn't able to say when they'd be able to get four, five, six, seven, eight, nine done. Um, if you look for a bargain, be careful and make sure that the person is, if, if they're not earning enough to, to support themselves from the work that they're doing for you, they're probably not going to be there when you need them again. Yeah, I, I just want to add the um, another another thing to look for. Oh my God, now the thought has just gone right out of my head, and it was important to. Dang, it'll come back if I think about it. Um, with regards to like romance book series, a lot of them are typically intercorrect in interconnected standalones. Mm -hmm. So when you have like a five book series, and each series is a different couple. Do you recommend the same narrators or different narrators for each book? I, I don't do a lot of, I mean, I can, I can speak to, I just started Hold a series. A I just started a series with uh, FAR 26, which is exactly what you're talking about. They divvied it up between a few of us. Um, various, so I don't, I don't do a lot of romance, so I don't know. I, I think it can, it can work both ways. Um, I'm currently doing one where it is interconnected and main characters become secondary characters in books and the same narrator and I are doing all four books in the series but at the same time um, there are plenty of very successful you know romance series that are out there and they do have different pairings but the the consistency and the characterization I think that, that's important, So, because people remember, especially if you're rapid releasing. We're going to remember as we listen. I, I think if it's not the same protagonists throughout the series, mm -hmm. then either way is fine. I mean, if you have the same protagonists, you kind of want the same narrator to go with them yeah. from book to book. But otherwise, I, I don't think there's really, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, really. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with the interconnected issue. You know, if, you, if it's sort of a a brother's type of thing and, and the, the other brother is in the one book and he's already been characterized. I did remember what I was going to say though. Mm -hmm. So to the <laughs> red flag. <laughs> so a lot of writers are readers and fans of books and read a lot of books and don't listen to a lot of audio books. So what I would say if you're, if you're thinking of casting you know, your mm -hmm. own book, um, listening to books that you're going to be competing with in the, in the category um, not necessarily to get that narrator particularly, but just to kind of understand and educate yourself about what works, um, and and then listening to the books of the narrators you're approaching, I think is also helpful because then you can you know you already you know you have an advantage, and you're you're learning the customer expectation. We have the author expectation, and then there's the customer expectation. They're not necessarily the same. Thanks so much. Off that I have uh, interconnected and one guy's British so when he's in other ones how is that gonna play out I never thought about that oh my Darn goodness <laughs> yeah that's one lot. of the surprises that you want to um, communicate to your narrators mm -hmm. yeah I mean that's that's definitely something you ought to think hard about because not so every whoever I hire for the male part is gonna have to be able to be do able a British, to do a British even accent British. yeah and depending on how big that part is going to be you may want to Cast a, a different narrator. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's the main character in one book, but then he's the, like small, small character in the other books. Yeah. Okay. That's oh, tricky. tricky. Yeah. I come with an online question, and I, I'm sorry to online person. I hope I'm translating this right because I kind of had to ask them to clarify. Um, we, it's a middle grade author, so they said age range like nine to thirteen, and I believe they're asking 
how to find a narrator that can meet the unique needs of a book written for that younger audience. They say they can search by genre, but they're, I guess, having trouble finding specifically like for their middle grade books. How, how would they go about that? Well, I can speak to that having done middle grade books. It's really not different mm -hmm. than finding an author, than finding a narrator for a thriller or, or fantasy or horror or, or romance. You, you know what you want to hear, what the tone of that book is. So as, as Victoria said, listen to other middle grade books, find out what the, what the popular voices are so you get a sense of what the, what the sound is of that genre. And then you find your narrators based on that sound and give them, like going back to that, the, the audition script discussion uh, talk we had, give them everything that you want to hear in that audition. And it, it's really the same, the same thing. There's no difference. Anything to add on pen name, um, pseudonyms, sorry, pen names, pseudonyms and separating out? You mentioned you have your other pseudo. I do. Um, not every narrator is going to be upfront with their pseudo. So um, if you're not sure, you can always put it out there and ask. Um, but be aware that ma many of us do use pseudos not only to keep the spicier stuff away from family members who may frown at us, I'm sure many can appreciate that, but also it helps the also listens because people who listen to me narrate you know, sci-fi and space opera probably don't necessarily want the reverse harem and monster romance. So names get separate and we don't have that crossover. I suppose this one can be a simple yes, no, but is it still, would you guys still agree or, I mean, uh, this is the advice I've gotten that with uh, if you're, main protagonist is, say, female, you'd want a female narrator and vice versa with, with male. I, it's, I mean, definitely if it's first person, uh, I mean, that is, okay. that has to be, I think, gender appropriate yeah. to uh, to the storyteller, but, but we've done, um, you know, because especially if it's fantasy where there's just a ton of characters, like, depends how dominant that, that main character is going to be in all the sections, I'd say. Yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, most also from reader response or listener response. Do like yeah, I guess also, you know, in in the market in the genre that you're looking at, do you know, like military sci-fi, like who your listener's going to be and what do they tend to like listening to? Um, you know, do they prefer, you know, a male-dominated kind of story? It, it uh, it's very market-based. I'm not going to say that men don't want to listen to women. You know, it's what a mistake that would be. Um, but but there are definitely gender dominated categories. Thanks. Right. So we got a minute and a half left. We don't have any other audience questions lined up. Victoria, you're you're on the front lines dealing with negotiations and whatnot. Y you know what's coming. Is there anything you can tell us in the last minute and a half? I'll well, ask a question. Um, how how um, can somebody know how long their audiobook might be to um, to estimate their 9,200 uh, words per hour. Just do that math. That's going to give you good close. W what's coming? What's coming? Um, well, Spotify launched their U.S. Uh, service today. I mean, they've been selling audiobooks uh, a la carte for a year, um, but today, they or yet to yes, maybe it was yesterday, they announced, you know, it's included in premium. So one of the things I, as a business, you know, as a publishing business person, I think that will potentially change is sort of this this length issue with you know that's Audible's credit worthy model you know we we deal with this all the time like what is somebody going to spend a credit on, but if you're on a different kind of platform with a different kind of marketplace, I think it opens up a lot of opportunity for shorter content, uh, which I, I yay for cozies yay yay for cozies exactly <laughs> exactly which always tend to be about you know forty five to fifty thousand words which of course is five hours, and that is that is not tremendously credit worthy. But again, it, but shorter stuff can definitely work. Again, come go to the category and see what you're competing against. All right, we started on time and we're gonna end on time here in six seconds. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>